so let's get started. Today, it's my great pleasure to have um, the such a renowned uh, panel of uh, uh, experts. Uh, first of all, let me just uh, get started who we are. And uh, today, also the first episode is uh, co-produced by three organizations. And this is also the first uh, webinar with our new logo. Uh, it's really fresh because I just finished a logo literally like two hours ago after a really heated debate within the team. So I hope you like it. Or right, so some of our speaker have our new logo. Thank you very much. And uh, who we are, we are BioVerse, which is a monthly webinar uh, co-organized by three organizations. Now the question is like, uh, what are the three organizations? Here we go. There's the three of us. First of all, as in science, we trust community, I sweet community is how we call ourselves. And we are nonprofits in New Jersey. The second one is the SAPA GP, which is a Sino America Pharmaceutical Professional Association with Philly chapter based in the great Philadelphia, obviously. The last one is a BioSpark, which is our new partner, new uh, co producer, which is a, a Massachusetts based uh, nonprofit. Also, focus on a lot of uh, biotech and uh, life sciences, uh, both in industry and academia. So that's pretty much the three of us. And today, you know, uh, if you don't uh, you don't know us, you don't you know hear us for the first time, please feel free to visit our website or LinkedIn or WeChat account or Twitter to learn a little bit more about the three amazing organizations. With that being said, now let's move on and dive into today's topic, which is artificial intelligence in drug development. And it's actually my great honor to have all those uh, very experienced speakers from very diverse corporate uh, and uh, you know specialty within the drug development uh, industry. And before I let them introduce themselves, I want to leave a housekeeping uh, introduction. So today's uh, the webinar going to be co-hosted by myself. I'm the founder of uh, iSuite Community. That's how we call ourselves in Science We Trust. We call them iSuite, iSuite Community. And I'm also a founder of a, a BD company, a business development company called iSuite by Advisory. My lovely co-host, uh, Laura Law, is an associate uh, IP attorney from John's Day. Uh, with that being said, two of us are going to be the MC, if you may, uh, the master of a ceremony for today's uh, webinar, and I would pass the baton to the individual speakers, let them introduce themselves and their company. So if you can spend a few minutes about yourself and your company, it'd be great. I'll start from the left. So Alex, uh, how about you start with yourself and uh, let me know if you need to drive the next slides. Thanks so much, Leon. It's really a, an honor to be part of this webinar. Thank you for the invitation. So I'll swiftly introduce myself in Generate Biomedicines. I'm the head of R&D at Generate and a medical oncologist by background. Next slide, please. Um, it's not advancing for me. There we go. Thank you. Um, so you know, just very briefly, why is AI important and what's the context in which it's developing? Up till now, we've lived in a world that's discovered and engineered, and as a as a world, we've really made incredible progress using these methods. Uh, next slide, please. But going forward, when we bring human innovation together with computational capabilities to generate, I think we're going to see real leaps forward, both inside the field of drug development and in many other fields as well. In the space of drug development specifically and of molecules, there's actually vast unexplored space that I think generate generative um, techniques are going to enable us to explore. If we think about just the protein space, nature has sampled less than a drop of water in the world's ocean. So there's a lot of space that generative AI, I think, is going to help us explore. Next slide. Uh, but there's a long distance between exploration and great drugs. And so I'm sharing the way that we think about um, success in drug development as we try and conceive of the spaces that we need to improve and intervene. So success, for in our view, is the product of finding an effective therapeutic hypothesis, finding an effective molecule to adjust that therapeutic hypothesis, and then conducting the right clinical experiment with the myriad of pieces of that puzzle, regulatory, operational, human, et cetera. 
And really to get a drug to patients, we have to get all of these pieces right. In terms of where AI can help us, I think it can help us in all of these and we'll be hearing about them from the different speakers today. Um, Generate specifically focuses on the middle piece of this complex puzzle. Next slide. And so our approach is to think about what are the main therapeutic challenges that still need to be addressed in medicine? Of course, there are many. And then how can we use AI to address them, specifically to address the molecular aspects of these major therapeutic challenges? So to do so, we use proprietary ML techniques and experimental innovation where um, the wet lab data is every bit as important as the dry lab data in doing so. We use those to try and create um, data that can then lead to ever better generation. And then on the right-hand side, try to use the integration of ML, experimental innovation, and data to um, lead to transformational molecular solutions. So let me pause there and uh, pass it back to you, Leon. Fantastic. So next speaker is going to be Lily. Lily, would you please introduce yourself and your company? Hey, Lily, uh, you probably mute yourself. Sorry. Thank you so much, Leon, for having me. Um, my name is Lily Zhang. I am a partner at the law firm Jones Day. I'm a intellectual property lawyer um, specializing in patent procurement and portfolio management. My technical background is in electrical engineering, computer science, and you might be wondering how I became involved in drug discovery. And it was definitely a circuitous route, but one where I think all the dots um, actually ended up connecting in retrospect. I've been working in the AI space since about 2016. Um, while life science has always been a part of my practice, particularly in the form of med devices and diagnostics, biotech AI use cases were more on the periphery of traditional high tech until the pandemic. And of course the rush to formulate a COVID vaccine. It's actually at that specific point in time that my practice took a serious pivot towards the application of AI and other computational methodologies in drug discovery. And this literally happened in those frantic early days of the lockdown. I have this vivid recollection of um, starting on a case using single cell sequencing data to calculate epitope specificity on the same day that the NBA suspended its season in the middle of a live um, game broadcast. And Fast forward to today, my practice is focused on helping clients navigate IP issues at the intersection between high tech and biotech. I've been incredibly fortunate to work with to work with and learn from many leading researchers in data science, structural biology, and medicinal chemistry. I'm really only half joking when I say that my practice really thrives on asking as many really smart people as possible, as many smart people, really smart people, as many questions as possible. Now, I'm just one of more than 220 patent specialists, patent attorneys and agents at Jones Day who are dedicated to transforming innovations into protectable, monetizable IP assets. Our IP practice group um, includes an incredible roster of over 160 life science experts, many with life science degrees in areas such as biochem, immunology, genetics, neuroscience, just to name a few. Um, in addition to the life science folks, we have over 10 computer scientists and physicists who, like myself, are incredibly active in the AI space. Even before ChatGPT sparked this collective AI frenzy, the firm recognized the synergy between AI and life science R&D and invested heavily in developing legal talent in this area. Um, next slide, please, Leon. Now, IP is just one area of law we help clients navigate. To that end, Jones Day attorneys collaborate across practices to help our clients start, run, and grow their businesses. We're not just a typical full service law firm with disjoint practice groups and specialists. It's the firm's mantra that we work with our colleagues and other practice groups to make sure the best people are staffed for every matter. And next slide, please. And this collaboration also extends across countries and continents. We have some 40 offices in 17 countries, and our motto is one firm worldwide. 
meaning that our clients can count on us to provide the best possible legal service almost anywhere in the world they do business. And as Jones Day attorneys, this also means the perk of having friends and colleagues almost anywhere we travel. I myself am thrilled to, um, to visit our Shanghai and Tokyo office during the, this current Asia trip that I am on. And um, to wrap this up, I just want to say that I'm incredibly honored and excited to be here. Thank you, Leon, for having me to be a part of this incredible panel. Yeah, thank you, Lily. So now let's uh, uh, invite Sharon to share a few words about your company and yourself. Sure. Uh, this is Sharon Chen. I'm the CEO of i for Life Sciences, which is a uh, probably relatively young compared to other companies. It's a four years old and uh, um, uh, started uh, from APAC, uh, but currently globally distributed uh, company. Uh, I'm so lucky to work with a group of global leaders in both the computer science field as well as a life science field, especially focusing on clinical trials. Um, we uh, uh, This is a startup actually quite innovative in a way. We actually got into Microsoft for startups uh, program, got into Google for startup, and got into JLab. And uh, very recently, we also got accepted into um, NVIDIA's inception program. So uh, inspired by all those uh, good companies, big companies, we are trying to looking for ways to really to empower the clinical trials uh, in the field and hopefully to expedite the process and streamline process with automation, efficiency, quality to eventually bring the medicines, our sponsors to like a, a time to market to cut short. Uh, we've been working with quite a few big pharma companies across the globe and uh, using our AI, particularly generate AI to power the solutions on both the data part as well as the document part. Uh, maybe move to the next slide, please. Thank you, Leon. So uh, I think that the whole market is kind of um, experiencing some um, challenge of the uh, increasing cost of developing a new drug and how we really, uh, really cut down the time to the time to market. But uh, in terms of clinical trials, the area we are focusing on is being always uh, um, very challenging in a way, maybe uh, there are so many different expertise in different areas and they need to talk to each other in a, a relatively challenging way. And the current system offering, software offering also is relatively point solution. So I think the company is really focusing on to build a end-to-end -end solutions in a very intelligent way, and high, but highly composable, provide lots of modularized uh, uh, solutions to the for the uh, CROs and the sponsor to be easily adapt to. But with the power of the generated AI, uh, certainly the document related information can be easily, more easily comprehended. And uh, we've been using these tools to apply to many of use, use cases, including, for example, medical writing, uh, lots of automatic generation of the protocol design, as well as the clinical study report, as well as the SAP and many other documents, but also doing a lot of part of the data management, automated database build to help with uh, uh, electronic uh, data collection, and also part of the management part of the clinical trials as well as the regulated related areas. So in a way we are looking at, it doesn't matter it's a text representative of data or the digital representative data as a whole streamlined uh, uh, representative of the clinical trials and really trying to bring the trials uh, like efficiency in place and by, um, uh, for example, uh, the, for the efficacy and the safety, so calculation and the collection and design to be uh, easily uh, making sense for the for the, our expertise. Next slide. So we're also trying to quickly kind of um, build our system, our tools into the ecosystem. And uh, for typically use the example as a medical writing as a starting point and relatively easier, like a low hand fruit. And uh, together with the Microsoft as an editing tool, uh, uh, like a summer rim system, regulatory information management system, like a Viva as a uh, life cycle of the document. And also please review as a collaborative document review tool. And we, our focus really trying to help focus on the domain specific content generation, collaboration, and the domain specific flow management and bring really the time efficiency and the quality improvement in this process. And next slide, I think this is my uh, last slide. 
and uh, maybe click on the little video and quickly go through a one minute video talking, a uh, showing case uh, how this uh, combination of the general AI can almost fully automate the process of generating a clinical study report towards the end of the uh, database lock. So it's, uh, uh, it's built into as the adding into Microsoft Word environment and uh, start to help the biometrics team to automatically sync into the table figure listing, the biometric status data, and uh, start to fit into the CSR in the right position. And then through the automated update and also mapping us also eventually the uh, general AI powered content generation based on all this complicated uh, uh, description of the efficacy and the safety, uh, it's actually bringing the whole system and the process in a much faster format. And uh, uh, actually with the uh, RIM system integration, we are able to generate the full automation of first draft as a pre-process process. So that's something we are looking forward to. All right. Thank you, Leon, and back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. That's very helpful. I really like your video. So now let's uh, uh, also invite Li Pong to share a few words about yourself and your company. Li Pong, floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Leon. And uh, yeah, it's uh, really my honor to join this event. I think even like after this about 10 minutes uh, introduction, I already seen this very interesting dynamics and a very diverse application of AI in drug discovery. Uh, yeah, so myself, uh, I'm Li Peng Lai, and uh, I came from XtoPi. I'm the co-founder and uh, currently the chief innovation officer uh, of XtoPi. Um, so uh, we know that uh, to find a new drug, it's like exploring uh, a planet with uh, life in the outer space. So the, the odds is very low. So we, we do need some uh, really cutting edge technologies to increase the probability of success. So at XtoPi, our uh, vision is to integrate a computational approach, especially AI, together with uh, high throughput experiments, especially with uh, robotics and uh, automation to increase the efficiency to find the new drugs. Um, maybe next slide, please. So uh, XtoPi was founded uh, at MIT uh, around like 10 years ago. And uh, when we started, actually, we really focused on very uh, niche direction in drug discovery. Uh, we spent like two years to develop new algorithms to uh, really design uh, or discover new crystal structures for small molecules. And then uh, gradually from there, uh, we, we really emphasize like how to calculate the interaction between molecules. So we expand our business from crystal structure to uh, the design of small molecule new drugs. And then uh, to uh, biologics in 2019. And at the same year, we start to build our own labs. So uh, we are trying to really generate high quality data by ourselves. And along this path, uh, we are supported by uh, our customers and the multiple investors from different uh, fields. Uh, and like two months ago, uh, we are listed uh, as a public company at Hong Kong Exchange. Um, maybe next slide. So uh, currently we were, our uh, colleagues are located at uh, four offices globally. Uh, we have three offices in China uh, from Shenzhen and Shanghai uh, and Beijing and uh, one uh, office in Boston. So we have more than 700 employees and currently we are uh, partnering with more than 300 customers or partners uh, globally, including uh, very large pharmaceutical companies and uh, early stage biotechs. Yeah, next slide, thanks. So uh, we are actually working on multiple uh, fields. Um, so the, the first one is uh, to really focus on to use AI and automation to accelerate the early stage drug discovery. Uh, so this includes our ID4 Inno platform that focuses on small molecule uh, drug discovery and also our ILEX platform that uh, focuses on antibody discovery. And the other thing is we are trying to provide our partners with uh, uh, intelligent or automated uh, lab setup. So uh, we're providing this extra dynamics, which is uh, automated uh, uh, lab um, 
services and also the cameras, uh, which is to use this robotics to really accelerate the chemical synthesis and the solid study for small molecules. And the last part uh, is what we found is uh, AI is not just a single tool. It's actually in our mind, it's more like an infrastructure. So we are trying to really build uh, ecosystems uh, around this infrastructure. So we are helping uh, our partners, especially uh, the scientists with early stage ideas to translate their ideas to uh, real useful commercialized products. So the last slides. Um, and just a few more words about the ecosystem. So currently, uh, other than the platform we're trying to provide to our uh, partners, we're also trying to integrate the AI technology, the uh, financial side, the uh, like from the, the uh, early stage investors, and also the ecosystem, like uh, uh, companies with different technologies together to form this triangle. And we we'll hope that there will be some nonlinear growth of new technology or platform or new products from this uh, uh, interaction between these three parts. Uh, I think that summarized my uh, introduction. Thanks, Leo. All right, thank you so much. That's a really, really helpful. And uh, now, uh, oh, by the way, can you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. So that's really, really helpful. And now let's just uh, bring everyone to the, um, to the panel discussion. Now, I hope uh, hopefully all the audience uh, have a little idea uh, why we invited all those like a prestigious uh, speaker to this uh, platform. And, uh, you know, we have some question really want to ask the, the odd, like, you know, the speakers to share your thoughts. Um, my first question to the whole panel is, uh, what are some of the ways AI can be used to facilitate drug development process? What are the, you know, advantages and limitations of uh, using AI in the drug development. And probably I can start with Alex, if you can give us some quick thoughts. Thanks, Leon. Um, maybe I'll start high level and then I know each person has you know, a, an expert view on different pieces of the puzzle. So as I mentioned in my introduction, I think if you think about getting to the right target biology, making the right drug, and then asking the right clinical question, AI has the potential to impact all of those. Um, I think Sharon's movie showed really well how if you really drill down to the nitty gritty of what you need to do to get this work done, AI is already helping there. And I think we're increasingly seeing, as Li Pong showed, um, AI being applied to the discovery of the drugs themselves. I think that will take a little bit longer to show the field if it's working and how it's working because of the time of drug development. And then in the long run, I mean, we understand so little about biology right now. It's actually remarkable how far the field has come given what we do know. Imagine when we're able to generate the data we really want to, to understand the full complexity, heterogeneity, and dynamism of the diseases that we're trying to treat. I think ultimately AI will, will help there as well. So I, I see a lot of promise ac across all three areas. In terms of risks, you know, I think we'll get to the um, risks around those things, IP, legal ethics, et cetera. I think the risks that we encounter every day are the quality of data that we're inputting because everything depends ultimately on that. So let me pause there and allow others to opine. Yeah, people just uh, feel free to chime in. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in my in my line of work in this particular space, I I've definitely seen AI wear so many so many different hats, right, in the drug development process. Whether that's identifying a drug will target, design drug uh, like molecules to modulate that target, make PKPD predictions, design clinical trials for that molecule. I think one of the bigger misconceptions I tend to encounter, right, is that there's supposed to be this single monolithic AI model that could do anything and everything, right? It's almost like this drug development version of AGI. And that's just not the reality, right? Drug design is such a multifaceted endeavor. Like many, many, many things will have to go right in order for a molecule to become a blockbuster drug. Which brings me to what I think is, is a hurdle, right, for the proliferation of AI and the life science sphere. And this is kind of a psychological limitation in terms of how people view 
um, the or gauge the success or failure in overall investment worthiness of this technology and drug development, right? Like right now, I see AI being judged primarily in terms of um, clinical trial success rates, right? Of like of these so-called AI designed drug molecules. And um, even though that's like a very visible metric, um, it shouldn't be the only metric, right? Because it overlooks like so many roles that AI could play throughout the development process to reduce time and cost and to improve outcome. Um, I guess in terms of limitations, um, the one of the one of the first ones I could think of is I guess this integration between um, dry and wet lab, right? So compared to the wet lab, computational resources are are, are fairly cheap, right? And and will trend towards getting cheaper. And to me, this is probably one of the biggest draws of AI, which is this promise of making highly accurate structural and functional predictions at a fraction um, of the cost. And I suppose if you do this fast enough and cheap enough, you could really see a future um, of truly personalized medicine, right? So for example, cancer vaccines that are tuned to each patient's specific tumor antigens. That said, you know, the pipeline isn't entirely in silico, right? At some point, a computationally designed molecule, even one that sort of passed the litany of AI predictions in terms of drug-like drug -like properties, that molecule still will have to undergo in, uh, in vitro and in vivo testing, right? And so this proverbial rubber hits the pavement um, moment means that there is still some sort of a resource bottleneck, right? And even if we do use AI to minimize it, it's still there. So one of the limitations and one of the things that we need to overcome is to find a bridge, right, between the dry and the wet lab. Yeah, like your AI model can spit out thousands, if not tens of thousands of candidate molecules, but what does that mean for the next stage of the pipeline, right? Where only a few can actually undergo wet lab testing. And um, what is the most sensible cost and result effective way to take those computational outputs, materialize them in the wet lab, get them through clinical trials, and you know, of course, <laughs> the billion dollar question is, you know, how you turn them into blockbuster drugs. And um, and I do wanna try and echo Alex's sentiment that um, data is 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 a limitation, right? Models are getting models are getting big and they're getting bigger, and we still have um, not as much data as we need, right, to train them to perform as well as we need them to. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, since we have a lot of questions, I would really appreciate you know we kind of get uh, probably like get 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 a little bit shorter uh, answers uh, going forward. Because I want to make sure, Lily, you get a time to sleep. <laughs> so otherwise, we, we're going to be like, you know, uh, put a lot of people really late. So I have uh, a 4.30 you know, a.m. meeting. So I think I, know, I think I sleep might be optional <laughs> this evening. Yeah. So Li Pong, any thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, um, the, the other two from Alex and Lily. So I, I think that they already have very uh, complete uh, response to this question. Uh, Maybe something more. Uh, uh, I think we talk about AI uh, in like drug discovery, and uh, and I think we also uh, say lots of applications for AI in clinical stage and even in the market stage. So, uh, especially if it, with the capability of large language models, it can help us to summarize uh, a bunch of information so actually way beyond we can imagine. So I saw examples of AI to like uh, analyze the clinical uh, uh, data or for the uh, market data. So they can help uh, the BD uh, or the salespeople to uh, get better strategy uh, for the product launch. Uh, I think the limitation, uh, maybe one thing. So there are two things uh, to to cause a limitation. One is for the uh, uh, how to say the the quantity and the quality of the data currently. So um, so uh, it's still very expensive to get uh, new data for uh, biological uh, assays. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, that's uh, important to uh, design some new experimental methods, either with automation or with some high throughput, or even more, uh, I don't know, like organoids or some other uh, experiment uh, models to generate high quality data. And uh, another uh, one is, I think uh, we do have the data, but uh, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's kind of hard to access the data uh, for commercialized companies. I think that probably uh, more from the legal or from the policy uh, perspective. So uh, when we consider about the privacy or uh, some other things, there are lots of challenges to solve. 
before uh, we can really access the data. So uh, I think that uh, can be the limitations, uh, but I believe it can be solved probably in the near future. Yeah, as two cents, yes. Yeah, thank you. Shara, anything you want to add before we move on to the next question? Shara, you muted yourself. <laughs> Okay, I will make it very yeah. quick. And uh, then focusing on clinical trials, which I'm most familiar with. And certainly, uh, I think from McKinsey's report recently or last year, they mentioned actually for general AI, uh, it can create 13 to 25 billion annually in clinical development. Mostly, as I mentioned earlier, could be the trial performance co-pilot or smart data management. And also, especially very recently, I think many of the pharma company are looking at the submission content writer. Uh, so as a general AI, because because it's more language model. So in a way you can imagine, I'll start to really understand the document or text or lots of uh, information in this field more smartly. And it can be structured that in a way to help with the digitized uh, solutions. So that's, I think, the opportunity where it stands. And it can also help uh, understand, because multi-model, so start to with lots of real world evidence, all those things can be able to detect the risk sooner and for people to mit mitigate the risk sooner and uh, hopefully to bring the medicine uh, time to market cutting very short. And in terms of challenges, uh, generally I the typical like uh, performance, capacity, Hustlination quality would be the typical areas that uh, people are worried about. And certainly data privacy could be another thing. So in terms of those three areas, I hope the large language model itself can improve uh, quite a bit. But when we apply those things into this particular highly regulated uh, field, I think just deep understanding each of the problem space and providing lots of mitigation process is very, very necessary. Fantastic. So let's now dive into the individual topics, right? This is a really open remark that I already learned quite a bit. Now I'm really looking forward to like specific topic. The first one is really about small molecule. I mean, if you talk about small molecule, uh, you might remember the, one of the best examples is shooting girl, right? And Inbus, they have this um, a TIC2 uh, molecule, which get our license to Takita for a few billion dollars. So this is probably more to, I, I would say, leap home because, uh, you know, as a trained uh, astrophysics uh, physicist, right? That's what I learned during our preparation. What's your view on this, uh, you know, kind of uh, AI powered uh, uh, small molecule drug discovery, especially uh, given like the recent success example of Schrodinger and Limbus, which lead to the multi billion, actually $4 billion uh, MA, which is, you know, kind of validated. This is a really kind of interesting technology. What, what's already there? What's on the horizon? Well, what's your view on this? Yeah, thanks, Leon. Um, yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, Actually, we, we have seen lots of dynamics uh, in these fields. Uh, I think uh, as early as in like 2013 or 14, uh, when people first talk about AI drug discovery, it comes from small molecules. Uh, I believe that's because for small molecules, by that time, uh, we have the most of data uh, accumulated from the history. And uh, uh, even for the computational uh, methods, I think most of the methods are dealing with small molecules. And I, I think in terms of the business, business side, um, we have seen uh, lots of deals. Uh, as you mentioned in the question, uh, there are very big deals between uh, AI or computational drug design companies and, and probably the big pharma. And even for ourselves, I think, uh, for example, last year, uh, we have this uh, collaboration with Eli Lilly uh, on single pipeline design with AI and automation. Um, and uh, recently, we also uh, noticed like multiple uh, AI design drugs go into the clinical stage or move from like phase one to phase two stage. Uh, but, I think, but I think the significance is not only in the uh, single deal or single pipeline, because uh, I think from the uh, Boston Consulting Group uh, reports, uh, there is actually a statistical significance uh, difference in the success rates uh, for phase one and phase two study uh, for the AI design molecules. Uh, I think that's exciting uh, because usually uh, investors ask us like, uh, what's the success rate for uh, AI design drugs? But by that time, there's only like very individual uh, successful stories, but there's no statistical uh, significance. But now we can say like there are like uh, enough examples so that we can say uh, AI design drugs has this or that advantages over the uh, conventional methods. Um, that other thing is, I think mo most recently we 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 see some uh, new dynamics 
uh, in this AI, AI drug discovery uh, landscape. Uh, for example, the merge between recursion and extension. Uh, we, we know that these two companies have th their own uh, advantages in their technology, uh, but uh, we noticed that this is not just a, a deal from the uh, uh, traditional uh, buyer and seller. Right? It, it's, a, it's a merge between uh, two AI dis drug discovery companies uh, who can, I believe they can really uh, synergize uh, their uh, specialties together to probably bring some new things to this field. And technology side, uh, we see uh, many, many more uh, very interesting uh, AI models and uh, uh, new integration between the dry and wet labs in the small molecule AI design. Uh, this will, um, probably some example is, instead of just looking at the, the molecule level, as I uh, noticed there's a more integration uh, between like small molecule structure design with clinical data or, or with uh, much larger like uh, cell level, single cell level data, uh, like omics data or phenotyping data. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's a big step forward to really uh, trying to solve the challenge between the preclinical study and the clinical success. Uh, the other thing is uh, a deeper integration uh, of AI into the DMTA cycle. Uh, so that's uh, uh, another thing uh, when we work together with uh, AI uh, molecule design and also the automatic chemical synthesis. So that can really reduce the time cycle to uh, finish one uh, iteration of the DMTA uh, cycle. So reduce the time from maybe two to three months to a, a few weeks. So, um, I mean, I, I know there are lots of uh, details, but I mean, there's a, I think there's a big uh, trend uh, in really improving the efficiency of AI uh, small molecule design. And uh, in the future, I, I think the uh, probably the most significant uh, change will, will, will happen uh, when we integrate the clinical data together uh, to uh, design new small molecules. So that can probably really reform the current workflow of drug discovery. Fantastic. Anyone else have anything want to add before we move on to the next topic? I'm pretty sure you have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> All right. So now that this uh, ask Alex. So I mean, I remember I, when I watched your video, how you kind of create a drug, you know, literally create a drug, you know, in front of us in like five minutes, which is an antibody. Actually, you create an antibody in front of us. I remember like this February and the conference in New York. And can you talk a little bit about how AI, especially like the impact in the biologics design, and also know you have some biologic design by AI right now in clinical trial. What's your, what's your thoughts over there? What what's the highlights you you think the field should be paying a lot of attention? Thanks for the question, Leon. So um, I think conceptually there are two main areas that I would say biologics development. Um, can be thought of as having been impacted or being impacted by, by AI. The first at, a, at the simplest level is to be able to design the drug that you want and not um, fall victim to the vagaries of some of the systems that are currently standard for developing drugs, uh, developing biologics, which have um, built in sort of biases and blind spots. So as specific examples, you can go after targets that aren't immunogenic where injecting an animal wouldn't work to identify uh, an antibody or some kind of binder, or you can design exactly the kind of binder, the kind of structure that you want, rather than being bound to the structure of the system that you're using. Another example is um, the ability to bind um, a particular form of a dynamic molecule, um, in other words, to catch it in the confirmation that you want. So that's the first piece is designing the molecule you want. I think the second piece that is also important is being able to concurrently um, optimize the attributes of a drug at the same time. So um, in current sort of standard systems, you typically alter one attribute as a, at a time. And that means when you turn knob A, sometimes knob B goes in a different direction that you don't actually want. What AI helps you to do is to optimize concurrently so that, for example, you can increase affinity without losing specificity. Um, so I think those are the two concepts I would highlight. As you mentioned, we do have two drugs in the clinic. Um, the first has finished accruing its phase one, and that was of a 
uh, a monoclonal antibody targeting a non-immunogenic epitope on SARS. And so this is an example where the field knew that this would be a valuable epitope to target because it wasn't um, mutating, because it wasn't under immune pressure. But using conventional methods, people weren't able to get to drug-like properties, whereas using AI, uh, we have been able to do that. And we'll present those data um, in about two, about two months with, with the details. So let me pause there and let others speak, Leon. So I guess, uh, Li Pong, you have anything you want to add or anyone else, you have any thoughts, please feel free. I want to make this as a discussion. <laughs> There's a two expert, right? Pretty good on drug discovery. I am not. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, the, the the answer from Alex is, uh, is, is uh, very thorough. Uh, maybe uh, a few points uh, from our uh, observation. So uh, I, I think the big success of AI in biologics is uh, some similarity between the structure of biologics like proteins or RNA DNA uh, with, with uh, uh, natural language. So uh, it's like actually for us, uh, it's more like a language of life. Um, from a physicist perspective. Um, so uh, I think other than uh, proteins, uh, we say in along this direction, we also uh, notice the success of AI uh, in the design of uh, RNA, like uh, to use AI to modify the RNA sequences to uh, increase the translation efficiency or stability uh, of this uh, uh, mRNA or sRNA. Uh, the other thing is we also notice the, the integration of different biological design uh, to build new solutions. So uh, one thing we actually are working on is, um, so that's one example. So from XOPI, we uh, we designed some AI algorithms to design this so-called uh, new antigens. So we can analyze the peptides from mutated uh, proteins for cancer cells to predict the complex structure between uh, the peptide and MHC structure. And uh, the other company, uh, ClickMap, which is an incubated company from Xtopi, so they are working on using AI to design humanized antibodies uh, with any given uh, antigen structure. So when we combine this together, actually that brings some new possibility uh, to uh, CAR-T or TCRT therapies. So we can use the prediction of the complex structure between peptide and MHC and the design of uh, antibodies to bind to this structure to uh, actually explore the new uh, possibility of targets for like CAR T or CAR NK therapies. So we see this trend like when we can use AI to design some biologics and we can integrate the different methods together to maybe uh, open up some new possibilities. Fantastic. Now we are done. Uh, let's uh, learn a little bit about the drug discovery, both the small molecule and biological. Let's move on to clinical development, which is like, you know, based on McKinsey reports, the 70% of R&D costs, right? So Sharon, what's your view? How can you save, help us uh, save money and then make it faster? You clinical yeah, development. I'm working on it and I hope I can contribute. It is uh, it's just, it is a big part of the cost, <laughs> cost uh, part and also like uh, the time spending part. I think early on there won't that much of the AI to apply to this particular area compared to drug discovery. It's more because of the this is a highly regulated and also heavy process uh, ish uh, pro uh, uh, journey, right? And it's a long lasting and also different area of uh, expertise work on different pieces. So I think, uh, but the best thing about the uh, generative AI, the very recent uh, breakthrough of this technology, is sometimes can help with closing some of the loop. For example, using the clinical study report and many other, like a patient safety narrative or many other document related, also a data related. Early on, we can use a program to join table and collecting data, but then in terms of a comprehend or a bringing inside of the data, that part is missing. So now with the large one road, we can start to be able to um, understand and report those problem and start to build a closed loop process. And uh, many things like that, right? Um, uh, I think the general AI is an opportunity, not only just bring those uh, 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 what you can see the process efficiency. I think next level would be insight efficiency. And the newer level, even higher, is the concept efficiency. 
in a way to you really detect the insights based on lots of related knowledge. I think uh, one of the claim or one of the worry about uh, uh, generative AI is whether it can be consistently producing the the right information every single time. So it's really many of the prompt engineering where, where lots of deep understanding needs to be applied to this political process. But on the other hand, um, uh, AI is so capable for reading broad information, right? So maybe as far as you can limit the information they are working on, the AI is working on, it's more of a, for this particular field, actually they are are much in a way smarter than people because they can do non-stopping work across over the night and cross and with lots of machine power to help you. For example, like understand tons of documents from clinicaltrials.com, from EMA, from your internal uh, big giant farmers uh, information and to come up with, for example, the design of the protocol. Because when I talk about the design, there's so many different elements. Certainly, there's so many brains, right? Need to put in together from biometrics, from statistics, from medical, and everything. Uh, but also, there's also a learning with earlier experience and also understanding from the competitive landscape. Those are for information in the public materials, in the recent like uh, uh, like ASCO or some other uh, like meetings of materials. So I think AI can really help digest the information and tailor for particular use cases and uh, provide at your fingertip when you really need to make critical uh, decisions. So those are the areas that we are looking at. And also for the example, data management, right? And uh, using traditional, now we call it deep learning a traditional conventional AI. It was really a new thing a few years ago, but a combination with uh, general AI, you can look, really look, look, read lots of multi-model data or the real world evidence like image data, v, uh, like audio data, and start to understand uh, a more comprehensive uh, um, description of this patient and being able to detect, for example, a risk area earlier more data. Now you can read the EMR, EHR, to understand, for example, the uh, your uh, tumor's position, the size, the progression of that. Those are wording, right? And you can detect those and it can help with many of the aspects. So overall, there are many aspects that we can do and we can uh, apply and uh, with the like the missing hole uh, kind of filled up by generating AI by reading all this language representative information for the first time we are able to really uh, putting these pieces together as a whole streamlined process and sometimes you can eventually close loop the whole process and that's very critical for AI to start to play a role. So we're hoping with this new addition, uh, like the dramatic addition, this AI power, and eventually more and more people start to work on the AI aspect of the clinical trials to uh, then really bring the cost down and bring the time shorter to help with this industry. But the challenge is definitely there because this is really, really highly regulated and continuously the quality of the content being generated, the concept being recommended, whether it's really based on the right fact or many data is actually siloed, stay in different company and they are worried about the data being disclosed or like a two large language models. So there are many uh, understanding of the new technology and how that can governance the policy and help with this industry. So it's, it's a big topic, a big problem space, and but lots of opportunities out there. Any other comments for other panelists? I mean, I learned quite a bit. And it's like a big problem, you know, it sounds like a huge uh, problem, but if you can solve it, also you're going to have a handsomely rewarding. Uh, any comments from the panel before we move on? Yeah, just a very, very quick thing. Um, uh, I think there are like probably more opportunities here uh, for AI applying to clinical developments. Uh, I think even for early stage drug discovery, because the clinical data is very important to uh, improve the preclinical models, um, uh, especially for AI models. Uh, so for example, so we are working with uh, some clinical company uh, to use the clinical data to really improve our in vitro models for drug screening. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also noticed there are increasing discussion between like the governments and also the commercial commercialized companies. Like, so people are trying to understand how to make full use of this data, even though 
there are lots of like uh, the uh, privacy issue or all the stuff. Uh, but we see there are increasing number of discussions on this between multiple uh, uh, shareholders. So um, yeah, so I, I believe uh, there are, there will be more opportunities here. Fantastic. So now I'm gonna move to the second part and my co-host Laura gonna take from me uh, from there. And Laura, uh, do you mind take from me? Thank you. Um, so we have just now discussed in detail various AI applications in job development. And uh, now let's uh, switch our gears a little bit and, and talk about some big picture questions. Um, first of all, let me ask uh, the speakers, um, what are some of the ethical, legal, and social challenges uh, the industry is facing when things are developed for that development? Um, so Alex, would you, would you like to share some thoughts first? Sure, I'm happy to. So I think um, this sort of black box element of AI can at times be intimidating or daunting to people. Um, what I think is actually a plus, and Sharon referenced this several times, is that we are in a highly regulated space. And so um, we the rules are clear. Uh, all of us are um, oriented to patient protection and there are many steps along the way to make sure that's maintained. Um, and so I think in our experience so far, and as I mentioned before, we're really very focused on the development of the drug piece. We have found that regulators, investigators, and patients um, have not had a problem with the AI uh, origin of the molecules at all. I think because the um, explanation of what they do, to your point, Lily, the preclinical testing that needs to be done is actually quite standard. Um, and so that part of the process is known. And so the unknown becomes less, um, less scary. Um, that being said, I think we have to be aware, and it's clear that this, this group and audience are, that our AI work is occurring in the context of the whole world's AI work outside of biotech. And so I think Lily could probably speak to this in lots of detail. We need to stay abreast of what's going on, not only in biotech, but also in tech and beyond that, because we're, we're apt to be impacted by what's going on um, outside of our space. And I think also, you know, we we need to self-monitor so we don't end up in a situation where we're excessively regulated. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I'll be next time to Lily. Uh, so as a legal expert in AI, uh, what are your thoughts on this question? So I, um, Alex brings up a, a really great point in terms of black box nature of AI, right? Um, I think one of the issues that I've I've encountered um, and it's brought up repeatedly is 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 bias, right? So we've heard of you know we've all heard of racial, gender, socioeconomic socioeconomical bias in AI, right? And bias is, in fact, a direct reflection of the quality of the training data, right? So AI models are not only data hungry, it's generally the case that they're garbage in, garbage out, right? So what that means is how well a, a model performs, how accurate its outputs are, for instance, is highly contingent upon both the quality and quantity of the data, of the training data, right? Um, quality in this particular context means that you need data that's well distributed across different categories. Bias, then, in a nutshell, is just really a result of training data that's skewed towards certain categories, right? And so in the context of drug design, bias can come from the lack of data for certain demographics of people, right? So particularly groups that are traditionally underserved or they lack adequate access to medical care, right? And this lack of data can mean either you have no data points for these folks, or in some cases, if they have very limited access to medical care and they only go to the doctor when they're sick, you don't have this longitudinal data, right? Or data um, from disease versus disease-free states. 
And so if we were to want to train a model to differentiate between, so for example, responders versus non-responders to a particular drug molecule, right? If you don't have data for a certain demographic, it will most likely mean that you have a bias model, right? A model that's just not going to perform well for certain groups. Great answer, Anyone else wants to the Right, let's move on to our next question. Uh, so the question is, how can AI companies in the biopharma and healthcare sectors uh, protect their IP rights? Uh, what are some uh, types of inventions people can protect relating to the use of AI in biopharma? Um, so really, again, I'm sure we will have a lot to say about this too. Thank you, Nora. Um, well, <laughs> I think, uh, First and foremost, it's important to think about IP protection in terms of each company's competitive advantage, right? And to consider protection, not just in terms of the end product, which is certainly very important, but also in terms of the continuum of the R&D process, right? Um, I think too often I see this being distilled down to a very binary decision, right? Like file a patent or don't file a patent which I think is just far too simplistic for this very complicated IP ecosystem that biopharma and healthcare companies inhabit. Um, so for AI, for instance, right? Like we tend to think there's three, three main categories of IP protection to consider, right? Like copyright, patents, and trade secrets. And they each sort of come with their advantages and limitations. Now, um, I'll start with copyright, right? You may have heard about, hey, maybe we'll just copyright our training data. And it's in fact actually a pretty hot topic right now with all these copyright infringement lawsuits being filed against LLM vendors, right? Like OpenAI. Um, currently, there's still legal uncertainty on whether the output of generative AI models trained using copyrighted material is sufficiently transformative, right? To not constitute copyright infringement. I think more importantly, in the context of biotech, right, and this type of data that we need to train our models, we also need to consider the practicality of, of using copyrights, right? So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example, right? So if you have a training data set of, of protein structures, right, you say we're going to represent them as 3D atomic coordinates, right? If you were to say, I'm going to copyright one set of those coordinates, well, it's actually a very limited set of protection, right? It's just that set of coordinates. It doesn't protect against the use of the same protein structures represented as a different set of 3D um, coordinates, right? So if you could just rotate it, translate it from a different frame of reference, you're outside of, of that, that, that protection. Um, another decision I think it's too often cast as, as this binary one, right, is, is patents versus trade secrets. Um, I think in this particular instance, um, it, again, you need to kind of consider this continuum of the R&D process, right, and, and, and what is the AI workflow here. Um, and I also, again, want to mention practicality because while it's incredibly tempting to say, hey, I'm just going to keep my secret sauce AI a secret, you have to think about whether it's realistic to do so, right? This is an industry that has overall a very high degree of this open science mindset, right? And you also do have a lot of collaborations and joint ventures. And so I guess the reality is that innovation doesn't happen in a black box, right? And open science doesn't mean you're just gonna give away your IP rights for free or do so without some accounting of who contributed what, right? And so in that sense, the goal of the patent system is actually very well aligned with that of open science community, which is to promote innovation by incentivizing the full disclosure of inventions so further improvements and discoveries can be made. And so going back to this trade secret versus patents, right? Trade secret doesn't protect against reverse engineering, right? And independent discovery. And so when I say the continuum of R&D process and your AI workflow, you need to realistically consider what portion of that AI secret sauce is susceptible to reverse engineering, right? And the corollary to that is then how much of my secret sauce do I need to disclose in order to obtain strong patent protection? 
Um, I guess all of this <laughs> brings me to the second part of the question, what can be protected, right? Um, I think here, this is where I see a lot of fixation on, oh, you know, it's either the architecture of the model itself, right? Or what about the output of the AI model? I think the second part is understandable because oftentimes the output is, is probably, you know, a molecule, right? And that's, those are the, those are what becomes those billion dollar patents for the Humeras, the Keytrudas, and, and the Trulicities of, of, of the Fonme role. But Molecules aren't the only valuable outputs of AI, right? In fact, like recent Supreme Court cases made it actually that much more difficult to claim like a whole genus of molecules in terms of their target, right? And so it's actually maybe even a worthwhile exercise to consider methods of in silico discovery or computationally defined genuses as, as ways, as, as, as claims, right? As possible proxies for these um, broader target-based claims. And of course, in addition to molecules, we've also seen biomarkers. And in the case of recursion, I think very recently, they, they say, hey, they put together this neuroscience phenome map, right, to support more downstream therapeutic development. So in other words, there are other valuable outputs to your AI model, right, that you, you should consider um, IP protection for. And of course, <laughs> we can't forget the AI itself, right? It's certainly worth an in-depth look as well. And especially this is where, you know, if, if you're a company, um, if that's what you're innovating in, right? If you're heavily invested in that space and th if that's your competitive advantage, you really do need to look into what parts of the AI is patentable. And when I say AI, I don't necessarily just mean the architecture of the model itself, right? In fact, if we completely ignore that architecture, there's so much innovation just in how we represent the biological data itself, right? So that the model can learn the critical features, right? And again, I'm just scratching the surface here, but you know, models are just, they're number crunchers, right? Whatever information we pass on to it, we wanna make sure that it's in a numerical representation that faithfully captures what we need the model to learn from the data. And so how we represent data and the many, many different ways we can represent data to improve um, the output of, of our models is actually a very interesting area that's worthy of, of considering IP protection for. And then finally, well, actually not finally, um, but you know, there, there are also innovations in how we can overcome the limitations that we talked about in terms of AI, right? And so like we mentioned earlier, how we integrate wet lab and dry, uh, dry lab, right? How we boost model performance in low data regime. Those are all areas we see innovations worthy of protection. So, so um, there are certainly many applications to, to keep in mind when we talk about AI. Focused on the kind of fund also that's good to see so so forth, as you just mentioned. Um, and of course, um ultimately uh people want to commercialize uh, what they do or what they can produce with AI. Um so our next question is um what opportunities uh exist for collaborations in uh, AI driven uh, thought about and um, what could make uh those partnerships uh, more effective. Um, so, Lee Kong, do you want to put a post on uh, this question? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, as I think this is a fantastic question. Um, what opportunities exist for uh, collaboration? Um, yeah, I think um, like for any kind of collaboration, uh, actually, it comes from the uh, mutual needs uh, from both parties. So um, we, we do say that uh, maybe several opportunities or modes of collaboration uh, along this AI drug discovery. So one is like along the vertical direction, uh, which means, uh, uh, so AI is kind of like a goose which can um, can give like golden eggs. So it's kind of collaboration on the eggs. So uh, for like AI pipeline companies, they can use AI to generate maybe some uh, first in class or best in class molecules and then they can uh, probably collaborate uh, with uh, Big Pharma or some other biotechs uh, on this on these assets. Uh, the other scenario is on the uh, horizontal uh, collaboration. So it's like a synergy between AI and other technologies. Uh, because we know uh, for AI companies, I think uh, the, the biggest uh, demand is actually for data. 
Uh, and we also notice, on the other hand, there are different technologies adv advancements which can really generate uh, high quality data like organoids or like uh, automation, uh, which can really reduce the cost to generate new data or the open up of clinical studies. And all this kind of technologies or, or data sources can really help the improvement of AI. And from the other side, uh, like for uh, other technology platforms, uh, I think AI can really accelerate like how people understand data or how to process data. Um, so uh, so there are a very natural uh, synergy between these uh, different uh, technology platforms. So I think that uh, provides the opportunity for collaboration. Uh, what makes this partnership effective? Um, I don't know, uh, probably something is like, uh, people should syn syn synchronize uh, on the expectation of AI. So uh, I, I think uh, Lily mentioned earlier, uh, AI cannot stand alone. So it need to work together with some other methods. Uh, and uh, also AI is not like 100% 100 perfect. Um, so uh, when, when people ask like, can you help me to uh, generate some haze with like 10 micromolar binding, uh, uh, affinity like within uh, six weeks. I think that's doable and it's very possible uh, by using AI to generate either small molecules or antibodies. Uh, but if people ask like, can you generate just only one molecule and this one can pass like all the preclinical tests and I can get the preclinical candidates uh, just like within one week. Uh, I think that that's not a reality. So uh, I just want to say we should have a fair uh, expectation about this kind of collaboration. So we know what kind of is, what, what, what's a ready uh, solution from AI and what is the uh, open up challenge. And uh, probably we are working in a mode of core development of some new methods. Uh, the other thing uh, for effective partnership, I think it's, uh, how to say, uh, for us, it's like uh, AI is like infrastructure. So, uh, we want like a real open uh, mandate or open environment for AI development because uh, from our perspective, AI is more like internet 20 years ago. So uh, what, what we learned from internet is actually the growth of internet applications uh, rooted in the uh, like open source idea or the open community. So I think for AI, uh, there it, it's, 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 it's already very open. So we have multiple publications. So people like uh, get their new ideas or new models, new algorithms published. Uh, I, I think this should continue uh, in this kind of partnership. We should be transparency uh, to our partners so that we are not really testing some new uh, methodology. Actually, we are using these tools to really generate values in our pipelines and assets. Uh, so I'll, I'll post here and uh, I'll probably pass to maybe other speakers. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we look forward to hearing your typing uh, partnership news uh, uh, Let me next turn to Sean. What are your thoughts, Sean? Hello, Sean. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Sean. Sorry about that, keep forgetting. Um, I think uh, uh, Lipan actually said quite a few good already. And I think maybe just echo his point of in this newly emerging like a, a AI world, especially general AI, it's how really each company can to fit into this ecosystem. I think certainly there's a NVIDIA and a Microsoft and OpenAI. Those are a model company or computing power company are rebuilding the foundation you know thing but it's very generic right so it's more of a how we can utilize all these powerful tools to be able to uh, apply to this either clinical trial drug discovery and some sometimes even deeper niche market or very narrow use case so i think it's important uh, for us to take a good advantage of those capability uh, but really really deep dive into each of the use cases uh, very deep and hopefully close the final few miles for our client, for the sponsors, for our CIOs, for many others. So I think it's important for everybody, uh, company, doesn't matter if uh, like a startup or maybe some company to think about your, like a, like a, your advantage, your competitive advantage and your really strengths and uh, 
don't reinvent the wheel. And that's some learning as me be leading the uh, startup company. Sometimes you're aiming for too big and you really want to try different things. But I think partnership with uh, lots of critical players in the world already is very important. Um, pick those few uh, areas that uh, we think each of the party or companies or uh, organization can play really well and partner with others, including, for example, our medical writing tools. We look at okay, the Microsoft Word is really so good at writing. Well, we actually trying to do invent view by building another world, Microsoft Word. It was a very stupid idea, but uh, really allow the medical writing using the word, word, Microsoft Word as the environment and adding an add-in to be able to contribute to domain-specific problems, solving those extra areas and together play with the ecosystem like already existing viva system for rim or like a please review for review so it is really putting all these pieces together and finding the sweet spot and help really contribute to the industry and help push the institution to the next level as soon as possible so that's i think we feel very passionate about and help to work with different organizations or companies to to help elevate the ai applications in this particular field I think Lipong and, and Sharon captured it really well. I think the point about competitive advantage or differentiation is critical. In our case, uh, for example, we have a wonderful collaboration with Amgen. They bring their biological expertise. They bring critical therapeutic challenges that they want to solve that conventional methods may have struggled with. And then we apply AI to those particular problems. On the other hand, for molecules that are in our own pipeline, we only plan to advance them so far because large pharma is great at huge clinical trials and commercialization. So know where your strengths are and collaborate so that you bring your strengths and those of a partner together. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so those are excellent uh, perspectives and uh, examples. Uh, now that takes us to the last question. And uh, let's let's look ahead into the future. Uh, so to all the speakers, um, what are some of the uh, future trends in AI technology, in your opinion, uh, that could significantly alter the uh, landscape of job development in the near future? Uh, let's uh, start with Alex. Thanks, Nora. I mean, at the end of the day, I think what we've heard today is we all want to get better drugs to patients faster. And the better that we can integrate with the diversity of this panel as a perfect example, the more successful that we'll be at that. I think within where I see the transformations happening, understanding pathology more deeply is so critical um, to all of the work that we're doing, ultimately being successful. Um, Yeah, I just want to echo what Alex said. I think we are all here because we want to see better drugs, right? Better drugs, more accessible drugs. Um, I, I, I think of AI as not just a tool to, to develop drugs, but a tool to, to shed um, better understanding, right? Deeper understanding, right? It's not just capable of processing large volumes of data, but very high dimensional data, right? Meaning we could really, really get far more in-depth look into our biology, into pathology, into so many different areas where, you know, I think as humans, we've explored a lot, but now we're really having the opportunity to dig deeper, far deeper than we've done before. And this is the promise that AI holds for me. Uh, let's continue with the uh, Yeah, I, I think Alex and uh, Lily uh, already raised uh, very good points. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'll just add something from very uh, specific uh, uh, sense we, we, are, we are thinking about. So uh, I think one trend is uh, the really integration uh, of AI and uh, the high speed, um, the high efficiency uh, experimental validation. So imagine that now it takes about one to two months to validate one molecule, but in the future, if we can do this with millions of molecules uh, just within one day, uh, that will really change how people discover new uh, modalities. Uh, the other thing is really uh, to use AI to bridge a gap between pre-clinical pre study and clinical studies. 
I think that we'll see in like how we use clinical data and how to use uh, maybe deep learning or large language models to uh, incorporate this data uh, into better uh, AI models. So that probably can help us to uh, increase the, the probability of success for uh, clinical translation. And the last thing, um, we're hoping that because we know our biology is actually uh, divided into very uh, uh, separated, not very separate, but into separated uh, vertical directions like uh, oncology or immunology or, or, uh, or metabolism. So all different stuff. But we are, we are seeing this trend like using large language models with multi-model data uh, probably we can have some more unified view of biology and that may help us to uh, get, like Lily said, uh, get deeper understanding uh, of the life ourselves. Um, so that may really help us probably to find new uh, mechanical actions or new targets or new possibility, the possibility of new therapies for this uh, uncure. So I guess uh, Li Pong, <laughs> we lost you in the last 10 sec uh, seconds. It's the most important sentence we didn't hear. Could you please repeat? <laughs> uh, last 10 seconds? Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure. So uh, oh, can, can you hear me actually? Yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, okay. No, can hear you. <laughs> yeah, probably I'll start from the last part. So uh, we are seeing uh, there is a possibility to use AI uh, with multi-model data. So it's like the data from uh, omics or from clinical trials or from uh, all the uh, drug molecule properties. So by integrating all the different types of data together, we can really uh, get a deeper understanding about, about biology, about life. So this can help us to maybe to find new uh, targets, new MOA or uh, possibilities of new therapies for all uncured diseases and really benefits uh, the, the patients. Thank you, Yuhong. Last on your list, please. Sorry, I didn't hear well, but I think you called down my name. <laughs> okay, right. Um, yeah, and I think you guys already said really amazing things. I think that um, maybe a little bit to add on is that I really believe the new technology of gender AI can have bigger and bigger impact. But it is a very new, right? And as people, especially this industry, is trying very hard to explore, but there are a whole lot of more things needs to be undiscovered. Um, and then the other, uh, the other thing is, um, I think the challenge is, uh, I also take a, a while for us to really figure out uh, how to overcome those those problems. So I think. Um, in terms of the trend, it's more like we, we had a very ambitious goal. I think uh, similar as many of the uh, industry players. Uh, so how we can really streamline the whole process from end to end for the entire clinical trials using unified system. And then I think with the trend of the AI to be able to do multi-model, to do language. So at some point, and the first time we think it's possible with this application of AI. So we love to work with everybody on that and hopefully to help with uh, um, the industry to gradually uh, pave the way to that uh, very ideal world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, we've got a lot to think about. Um, and many thanks to our fellow speakers today. Uh, with that, let's turn to the audience and see the questions. Uh, so, yeah, Leon, do you want to look, take it home here? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Laura. Like you're the host of the last part. So apologize to the audience because Laura's uh, microphone, I believe, problems pretty muffled. But don't worry about it. Uh, you can always uh, watch the uh, recap. So uh, keep that in mind. And now we're going to get into the uh, like question for the audience. Just to remind everyone, because you know there's a very competitive space, we probably will not take uh, any anonymous questions. So please identify yourself and your company at least uh, so we can uh, we can you know uh, take your question. And also there's actually there's one person uh, raise a hand want to ask a question. 
I actually don't know how this is going to work. I'll allow you to talk. So, Pao, I gave you a right to talk. You need to uh, unmute yourself if you have any question. So, Pao Deeper. All right, so I guess uh, you probably there. You have a little bit technical challenge. Yeah, please uh, type your question in the Q&A box. I'll start taking the Q&A uh, question. The first one, actually, oh, by the way, before you go that, and uh, if you really want to follow up, let's say get a copy of the deck or something like that, follow up question, please scan the QR code on the right of the screen. So I'm going to take you to the homepage on LinkedIn of all the series of uh, our webinar. In the meantime, if you have any questions, shoot the email to the email address I listed here. Now get to the question for the audience. The first question actually from Mark Chen. The question is, currently uh, much of AI work is driven by large language models. However, there's also the emerging concept of large quantitative models, LQM, probably you guys know better, which are based on scientific principles like chemistry, mathematics, and biology. Could you share your thoughts on both LQM and LLM and how they impact and are utilized in the biological and drug development process. I guess this is probably perfectly suited for Li Pong and uh, Alex. Why, why, why not you guys uh, take a take a swim first? Li Pong, feel free to start. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about it. Um, or large quantitative model and large language model. Um, I think that's a very good question. Um, so I, I think I, I actually touched this uh, a little bit um, as from the um, the question from Nora. So uh, how the opportunity to like collaborate uh, AI with some other technologies. So um, I think at some, so I mean, uh, LQM and LM from my perspective, uh, they have their own advantages and uh, the suitable applications in different parts. So when we deal with uh, something in the microscopic world, like the interaction between molecules, um, we we can, we can and uh, indeed probably we, I think we need to incorporate like uh, the 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 scientific principles like from uh, physics or from chemistry uh, to really inform the neural network so that it can understand better or can be easier to be trained uh, by the data to uh, get more accurate results. Uh, but I think in more uh, abstract or more complex uh, situation, uh, especially for the languages, uh, probably it's very so it comes okay, think... to uh... oh, I'm free. No, or... you're back. You just lost like two seconds. Please continue. Doesn't matter. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean the hotel, so the internet is not very stable. Uh, it keeps popping up on my screen. Uh, <laughs> So um, I think for the abstract level, uh, when we like try to really understand the, the image, like for example, the image of single cell or the, 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 the very high dimensional omics data, uh, probably we, we need to uh, really think about to use some uh, other approaches like large language model uh, to analyze this data. So uh, yeah, that's just my uh, probably <laughs> initial thoughts uh, yeah, on this from Alex may have more uh, to to I, I agree with what you said, uh, Li Pong. And as for our own models, we, we don't call our internal models LQM, but they certainly accept uh, and and um, uh, learn from quantitative data uh, ranging from structural uh, to experimental. Um, so I think the question is a good one and um, both are going to be needed the extent to which they intersect versus are independent, I think will depend on the use case. Perfect. So next question is from uh, Yang Yu. They have two parts. First question, and this is from Booth Business School of University of Chicago. The first one is, do you think there will be a monopolization of AI space in the future, especially in healthcare and drug development space? Or would there be fragmented development of AI solution as we go forward? I guess this relates to how much uh, it costs to build a good AI model. The first of all, second one is what is the exposure and expected rate of return? Well, this is always from business school. <laughs> uh, AI based biotech pharma related investment of uh, uh, private equity and VC firms. So first part is uh, you know you know 
Anyone want to take a take a chance on this? Leon, maybe I'll take the second part. Um, yes, go ahead. If that's okay with you, um, I think you know we we've done several raises at this point, and I think the theme in today's market is um, is value in drugs for a company like ours that where we specialize in that aspect and in making the biologic. And so I think the expectation is that the return on investment will be um, at least as good and hopefully higher um, because of an increased probability of his success from using these methods. So I, I think that's the sort of investing hypothesis that we're more likely to get to um, it, it co correct answers faster, where in this setting, correct means um, measurable clinical benefit that leads to a commercializable product at the end. Let me also try to give some of my two cents on both uh, both questions. The first one is like a monopolization. I think uh, in terms of the AI solutions, I don't think it will be monopolization. It's just so many different problems in the world. And it's even in the drug area, right? Just so many aspects of it. And uh, I think domain experts uh, would really play a bigger role there, a combination with the AI capability to solve the end solutions. So I really don't think so. But uh, in terms of the AI large language model, it's a it's a it's a question because often, like a Google search platform, right? Once it's take the lead, it take the leads, and uh, also in the Nvidia's uh, computing power, it's also uh, in the trend of maybe taking most of the part of it, the world uh, capability. And uh, AI, that's why also larger language, larger language, there's so many today are emerging, but they're competing so hard and putting lots of investment. So it's a, it's a thing to look at that. So like a cloud offering in the world, maybe now now down to three or four, but the first one take the majority of the pieces of market, but the AI model, it is possible the, the leading one will take eventually the bigger part of the market. And that's my two cents. The second one is all more on the, um, uh, yeah, I can skip the second one because the time really limited. Allow more people to talk to more questions here. Well, actually for the sake of time, we are wrong grossly over time, but a lot of people are still here. I'll pick only sure. uh, one question and then we're gonna uh, conclude today. So last question from the uh, Yong, Yongxin uh, Zhang. What is the trend of a large pharma? building their internal AI capability versus working with the specialized AI companies. So pretty much the question is that what's a big pharma's uh, preference? They want to build this by themselves, but they want to partner out with the specialist comp companies like, you know, we are talking today uh, on the panel. What's your, what's your sense? I actually, uh, I've been working with a few pharma companies and also especially the, the like a medical writing tools at the beginning, we certainly have a data management tool. From uh, my sense, I think those of the consultant firm has been uh, working on providing a uh, solutions in the sense of uh, giving a consultation. But uh, really, I think for providing um, AI capability, it needs a combination of the computer science related or the large language models, the skill set combination with those, a, um, I think, the do deep domain knowledge. So for the giant companies, they're really embracing, right? They do some things internally, but also they are really looking at external vendors to be able to specialize to the combination of these two skills and can quickly adapt to the new emerging AI technology, but also understand the domain domain problems. So I, I felt it's a combination of the two. Certain companies to do something in-house because of the data, they really care about keeping their own solution, but they're very, very open up the opportunity to uh, to uh, improve, uh, include the external innovating vendors to move very fast and very quickly, and also maybe dive deeper into the particular problem space. Any other comments? This last question. So I know some of you have to catch another meeting. And uh, any closing remark? Um, yeah, just a very quick uh, response. Uh, I think, um, yeah, I agree with uh, what Sharon uh, just mentioned. Um, so when we talk about AI capability, uh, actually, I believe we should break it down uh, into different perspectives. Uh, it's not just only algorithms. Uh, it, I think it's the capabilities related to like 
uh, how to prepare data, the management of computational resources, the development of new algorithms. So I think for Big Pharma, um, I, I cannot reprint Big Pharma, but uh, it's just from our observation. So um, I think uh, it, it, it will be very important to uh, really work on the data infrastructures, like how to structure data and how to uh, manage different versions of data so that it can be prepared to apply uh, AI algorithms either from internally or from uh, the outside. Uh, I think uh, from an uh, economic perspective, um, probably it's a good strategy to partner uh, with uh, external companies because especially uh, in this year of large language model, it costs a lot to really build a useful uh, foundation model for uh, for different applications. Uh, but I think the application is so broad so that uh, just by individual uh, pipeline, uh, the ROI is not efficient. So we should think about the building fund foundation models as an infrastructure. So it's better to partner with uh, this infrastructure rather than uh, build the infrastructure uh, just by oneself. So yeah, that's just my two cents for the last question, I think. Yeah, that's the last question. Any, any comments before we conclude? All right, thank you everyone so much. I learned so much and Laura and I really, really appreciate that you're uh, taking the time to join us. So one, like a, you know, kind of a, um, announcement because of a technical issue, actually we couldn't broadcast this uh, live to our China audience, but don't worry, we already fixed it. What are we gonna do? Our uh, partner in China will do this uh, live, uh, repro um, uh, uh, replay the uh, recording we already have today. So, you know, don't be surprised. You get another like tens of thousand uh, views in the coming two days. With that being said, thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts and insights with us and uh, learn so much about it. And for the audience, uh, if you want to get more information about us, please uh, send us email, follow us QR code. And before you leave, I have like a two quick uh, kind of a, uh, um, Announcement. The first one is, uh, you know, one of our three partners, uh, BioSpark, they would have the first uh, annual conference in this September in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Actually, it's going to be in the campus at MIT. Lovely place. If I've never been there, try to go there. Uh, another reason you should go there, look at the, the list of speakers that we have over there. Definitely some of the best speakers in our industry. And definitely try to check it out and book your calendar and stop by. And last but not the least, you know, Bioverse, this is our 12th uh, episode. We have another six pretty interesting uh, topics that we're going to discuss in the coming half a year. And we are looking for sponsorship. So if you are interested in sponsor any of those events or all of them, and that would be the best situation, please feel free to send an email to the partnership at iswtb.com. With that being said, thank you very much, everyone. I wish you a lovely day. And uh, hope uh, to see you again uh, in the near future. Bye for now and bye everyone around the world. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.